Hello everyone and welcome to NFL Girl UK Meets. I'm Liz Mandari and this is a show that brings you closer to the game you love. In this episode, I speak with Connie Carberg, the NFL's first female scout. In 1976, Connie joined the New York Jets under Mike Holovac, where some of the best drafts in the New York Jets history happened with her help. In our interview, Connie shares with me how she grew up with the Jets, what it was like to be the first female scout, as well as the highs and lows of the aftermath. Welcome to the show, Connie. How are you? I'm doing just great, Liz. How are you? Oh, I'm really well, thank you, Connie. Um, thanks for joining my podcast. You have got a career that fascinates me, and I know that our listeners would love to hear your story too. Now, your father was the team doctor for the New York Jets, so it was inevitable that football would play such a huge part of your life. What was it like to grow up in that environment? Oh, yes, it was wonderful. Um, from the time I was young, I was just what they call a tomboy. I always played sports of all kinds. And my father was an internist, and my uncle was the orthopedist. And when I was 12 years old, they both became the team doctors for the New York Titans, who then became the New York Jets. And I didn't know that much about football. I knew all the other sports because girls, at, in those days, girls played. You know, we all played basketball. We, all, we could play baseball. We could play softball, all the other things. But football really wasn't. So I still really didn't know it that well. But as soon as they became the doctors, I decided I better learn about it. And as soon as I started learning, I fell in love with the game. After high school, you joined Ohio State, where you learned even more about football from your friend and mentor, Woody Hayes. Now, I think it's incredible, especially at the time, to have been able to attend and be part of every OSU practice, whether it was open or closed to the public. How did this opportunity come around for you? All right, well, just as I said, I went through high school and I did have a, a, a mentors as where I kept learning the game and learning the game. I went to every Jet game and I sat next to a football coach who taught me a lot. So I had a lot of different great male mentors that taught it. And then when I went to Ohio State, um, I had to choose a major. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but, and I was in a sorority and all this type of stuff. But I started going to football games, which are really big at Ohio State. And one day I decided to go over to the student union because I knew that's where the football team ate. And when they came out after eating, uh, I waited and Coach Woody Hayes came out. And I went over and I introduced myself to him, told him of my uh, affiliation uh, with the Jets through my, through my uh, father and about how much I loved it and about going to the Ohio State games and all that type of stuff. And he was kind of amazed, I guess, with my passion and my knowledge and how I used to do mock drafts and all that type of stuff. And he said, you know, you have so much enthusiasm and you have so much love for the sport. Come on over. Um, Why don't we just meet in the office over at the stadium one day? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I took him up on that. And from there, I proceeded to meet with him. We had a nice long talk. And at that time, you know, there were no girl sideline reporters, no girl trainers, no women, uh, even regular, you know, regular reporters, uh, or very, very, very few, no women on TV. Um, There just was very, very few in the way of um, women role models. And so we, but we talked about my passion for the game. And he said to me, you know, right now there's probably, there's no real openings, but don't give up your passion. Keep following it. And what I want you to do is to come to every practice at Ohio State, whether I have practices open or closed to other scouts or to other people that are supposed to come in, you're welcome to come in. And so I did. Every single day, I'd be at practice. And I learned, and a lot of times there'd be scouts there, and I would talk to them, pick up information, learn. And he couldn't have been nicer to me. He was a great mentor, and it just kept building until I graduated in 74. Oh, that's amazing. Now, after graduation, you joined the New York Jets as a secretary. How is it that you came to be part of the scouting department? Yeah, I, I, I was hired when they built a brand new building at Hofstra University. That's where the Jets were practicing on Long Island. And uh, my dad had a 50th birthday party. And I was there and I was talking to different people. I was planning on um, being a home ec teacher and then coach girls sports after school. 
Well, I sat with Charlie Winner, who was the head coach of the, of the Jets at the time. And after we've talked football for a while, he said, you know what, we're building this brand new complex. Um, would you consider working for the Jets? And I said, are you kidding me? That would be my dream come true. I don't care anything more. I'll be there anytime you say, anything you say. So that's how I you know, began my start there. And they said, we'll start you out as a scouting secretary. But I also was a receptionist because I was the only girl in the whole building for the training staff, for the players, for the coach, for the general manager, for the head coach, for all the coaches, for everybody um, when they built that building. And they didn't start adding other secretaries and other people for a couple of months down the road. So that's how that all began. So I was doing like just about everything all at once. Wow. And I guess at the time, the NFL wouldn't have had a lot of women working in like a professional football capacity. So what was that like? Yeah, it really wasn't. I didn't even think about it. I just love, first of all, I love being receptionist. At that time, you didn't have to go through a lot of different people. So you got to talk to everybody that called in and you got to know everybody. And I was kind of like known as Connie from the Jets. And so I would just get to know everybody. Then at the same time, the scouting reports came in and working with the scouts. I was doing that at the same time. So it was really very exciting. Then my only problem was I didn't have skills to be a secretary as far as typing or shorthand or anything. And there was no such thing as Google. There's no such thing as looking up, knowing how to write the proper way to write a letter to people and do all that. So that was the only thing I had to learn. And I said, I was very blessed that Coach Winter hired me for my enthusiasm and my knowledge about football, not how many words per minute I could type. And so there were no computers at this time either. So it was a very different world, but I learned the skills. I always said, you can always learn skills. You can't teach attitude. So I was very lucky with everybody, you know, everybody that was in there was just great to me. And then soon they would hire the head coach's secretary, and then they hired um, another receptionist. And then I strictly went into the um, scouting part. Wow. Um, I can tell how much you must have loved your role. So how did it feel when you were told by Leon Hess that he didn't want a woman, I guess, traveling on behalf of the team anymore? Well, you know, when I was doing um, reel to reel, I was doing uh, film work of uh, grading films of the different players. At that time, it was reel to reel on the the uh, 16 millimeter and you were grading the films or... um, the scouting reports that were coming in, I was setting up where the scouts were going and making sure the plans and making sure everything was all set there. I mean, I was working with a wonderful gentleman named Mike Hollaback, who had been an All-American at Boston College. And at that time, and then, uh, he and Al Ward, who was the general manager, um, they, had make, they actually had me make a draft pick in 1975. I'm still to this day the only female to ever make a draft pick. And at that wow. time, there were 17, 17 rounds. You know, now we only have seven rounds. But in those <laughs> days, there were 17 rounds. Then it went to 12. And now we have seven. So I made that. And then soon after that, um, first, I, I didn't even expect it. I didn't look for it. But I guess they saw what I, what I knew and different things. And Mr. Ward and I, Mike Hallback, said, you know, it's, you, we'd, we'd like you to do scouting. So that's when, at that time, right about they are 75. I proceeded to go out to, in 76, to go out to Ohio State, Boston College, the Orange Bowl, uh, the local areas. I, I said, talked to players, graded films, you know, met with different people. It was wonderful. So I was doing all that. Um, Mr. Hess, we had a couple of different people that were owners at one time. But then he became the sole owner. Uh, before that, there were uh, about four or five that were owners, and slowly it came down to just Mr. Hess. And he was an older gentleman. And times were, if you have to put yourself back in those times, yeah. Title Nine had Title Nine had just started in seventy three or seventy four, and really it was a very rare thing. This was not even made a big issue of that I was scouting. If Dick Young, who was a very famous columnist and sports writer of his day, hadn't put that in the paper and the Ohio State written the article um, about myself. A lot of people were known because the Jets didn't say, okay, we have the first female scout here. They didn't yeah. just make a big issue. It was just, it was happening. But uh, then Mr. Hess had, I guess he, he spoke to um, Mr. Ward who came out and said, yeah, we just don't want you traveling as, as the representative as a scout. But 
uh, you're still you're still able to do local areas. You can still grade films. When we're, we're going to start bringing players in for interviews, like they do now at the combine, because they didn't have the combine at that time. Right. And when the Jets were the, the Jets were the first team uh, to start to bring players in as we got close to 1978. They brought in 100 players so for physicals and to interview them, and that's really how the as the combine idea began before it went to Indianapolis. So again, the Jets were ahead of the, the rest of the NFL in that respect. So I, you know, I looked at it, and I was, yes, I was disappointed um, that I couldn't keep going, but it, it was a, again a different time. And I looked at my whole job, and I love first of all my passion is football. Secondly, my passion is the Jets. Thirdly, I love, I love, I just loved working there. And, you know, you look at the whole big picture and what I was doing. And so I was totally fine with what I was doing. And I was still able to, as I said, grade films and do other things along with it. And, and you know, probably if I had made a fuss, I don't know what would happen. But secondly, um, the best part that happened to me a year later um, would not have happened. And what happened a year later? A year later was um, I had a new boss that came in who was kind of a tough boss. I had to prove myself. Um, he did not know me. I was as I had all these other bosses, bit different people that I knew, and there we were going to coach the Senior Bowl. And Walt Michaels was the head coach, and he was going to coach the North Squad. And then you have some somebody, another coach doing the South Squad. Well, Mike Stensrud, who was a defensive lineman, got hurt in a motorcycle accident. Oh wow! And so we had to find a replacement. So my boss was on the road and he called and he said, I need you to see if you can find a replacement for the defensive line. So I proceeded. Now, remember, you, it's not like nowadays where you have the computer and you can just say, okay, I got to find another guy at six foot five and 275 and runs a four, you know, four, seven, 40 or all that type of stuff. So you, whatever you have in the scouting reports and whatever films that you might have, there, there in your office, or be able to get you look at, and most of the the guys that are in the Senior Bowl already were the first round picks, and some second round. So the defensive linemen that you're looking at were probably figuring to go probably uh, fourth to seventh round somewhere in that area, probably maybe fifth to seventh in that area, okay? Because they're not quite top. So I looked at them, a lot of them, I narrowed it down to five guys. And I, they were very, very similar, except one player had much faster speed in the 40, but he was from a small school. And back then, you tended to say, oh, well, if you went to a smaller school, I, I don't know. You know, you're looking, at, you wanna, you're looking at the Alabamas and the Michigans versus a smaller school, right? Yeah. So I looked at that. I wasn't too sure. I said, what am I going to do? So I decided to call them all. Okay? I'm, very, I'm very big on the interpersonal part and what I think. So... I called each guy, and again, at that time, you can't, people don't have cell phones. You have to call the school. You got to track them down. You got to find them. So I called each one of these guys. Most of the guys, four of the guys that I called said, okay, yeah, I'll play or I'm, I'm, I'm ready, but, but when do I have to go? How long do I have to be? What's going to entail? They, they were okay. One player that I called said, I'm ready on the next plane. Just get me out there. This is my passion. This is all I want to do in life. I am so excited. This is everything. You could just feel him jumping out of the phone. So after I got off the phone, I looked up that player that came through with just like so much energy and passion. And that happened to be the guy from the smaller school, but had, ran a four six forty, And that was um, Mark Gastineau. Wow. I can't tell you that I knew that Mark and Mark was, you know, scheduled to be anywhere at that time, probably, you know, fifth, sixth rounders, that type of thing. Yeah. Didn't know um, that he was going to be the superstar again. He had taken a year at um, Arizona State, but then had transferred back home because uh, back home to East Central Oklahoma. So he played. He just they said once he got down to the practice down in the Senior Bowl, he was unbelievable. He got the most valuable defensive player um, in the Senior Bowl in '79. And that year, the Jets ended up taking Marty Lyons in the first round that they had the Senior Bowl and Mark. In the second round so and then it went on to history where you know mark turned out to be the sack holder for many many years yeah wow and so i understand that your husband took a uh, you know a, a new job in florida so obviously you moved there were you not tempted at that point to like continue your career in football 
That's a good, very good question. Very good question. You know, I, I got married and met the man of my dreams, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and we had to make a decision. And because um, he had a good, really good job offer in Florida, and I, I, it's funny when you're you first get married. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I said, okay, let's we'll, we'll go try it. And it was a big decision to leave the Jets because, as I said, that had been my whole life. So I did go down to Florida. Uh, I worked for the NFL alumni for a short time. The Dolphins are there, but you know my loyalty. And I had, I had opportunities because my Charlie Winter went to work for them, who had been the gentleman, the coach that hired me originally. A lot of other coaches, Dan Sikanovich, this other girl, Gail Baldwin, that I worked with. A lot of people, were, it's funny, went to work for the Dolphins at some point. So I know that it would be very easy for me to, to go down there and interview um, and speak with them. But um, my, I, there's no way I could work for another team. Yeah. My, and especially, especially the Dolphins, we were really rivals back then. Yeah. And was really, you know, that was, you know, right at the time, um, beginning of uh, Marino uh, versus O'Brien. Those were great, great years. Those were great games. And there's no way in the world that I could ever work for another team. It no, just, I, I not... like that loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really kind of a sickness, but I can't help it. <laughs> I, I could never give. <laughs> it just has been my whole life for so long that no matter what the Jets would ever do, <laughs> they have my loyalty and love. Oh, um, so you must have seen how football has changed, I guess, from like when you're a scout to like how it is today. Is there anything in particular in those changes that's like really surprised or shocked you? Well, yeah, there's been a lot of changes. I don't know if I like all the changes. I know part of it has to be for the safety sake, but I do miss, you know, how that, first of all, in the old days in training camp, they were there for, you know, six weeks and they were in little dorms at, at college, really kind of roughing it. And they had two-a-day practices, sometimes three days. And that was for two hours of solid, sometimes two and a half hours of solid hitting at each practice, full pads. And, you know, you go to practice, and, boy, it was easy to pick out who, who the guys were that were going to make it. Plus, you know, and that's how they played themselves into shape, too, because they were off um, before that, from uh, the end of the season before. And they worked themselves back into shape that way. Um, and they had six preseason games. Now they went down to four. And now, of course, they're talking about maybe changing it from four. Um, so those rules now, when I go to, when I go up there and you kind of watch it, they don't, they don't tackle full force. Half the time they're not in pads and, and everything. So it's, it's a little bit different that way. Also during the games, um, the, the whole, spread and the whole thing where now quarterbacks can't be hit by Joe Namath used to get hit and Dan Marino used to get hit and whatever whoever you were boy you you would take hits high low everywhere guys um, receivers coming over the middle could have you know they could basically they would be afraid to come over the middle because they knew that boy that safety coming up was going to take their head off but now there it's a very different game in that respect um we, those those hits and the ability now that a quarterback can slide and give himself up um, and not be touched and you can't hit low and you can't hit high and you can't put your body weight on him. There's so many yeah. different things. So it's a, it's a heck of a lot easier for a quarterback to run. I think that's why there's so much more mobility in quarterbacks. It's one of the reasons yeah. versus what there used to be. And um, so in some of the changes, I don't know if I like, I miss, you know, I do miss the, that physicality and yet I know they have to do it um, for what they feel the safety reasons and, you know, everybody got so up in arms to some degree over things, but I do miss the old way. I have to admit. Oh, and now you mentioned Joe Nama. So when you became a scout, how much pressure was there to draft like the next him? Boy, it's a, you know, he's, he's special. He really is. Joe was, uh, you know, he had the quick release, but you know, he had two, to bum knees. That's what's so amazing. A lot of, it's so interesting. I don't know if you see when we, you know, when you're on Twitter and everything else and, and people talk about Joe and sometimes they go, you know, why, what about, why is he in the hall of fame? His, you know, interceptions and his path and uh, touchdown ratio and blah, blah, blah. And I would say, if you didn't, if you weren't alive and you didn't watch Joe play well, all and watch the quick release and how fast he got back on those two legs and he didn't have great mobility. Plus he didn't, throw many short passes back in those days you really threw the ball downfield an awful lot and also he changed the game because of winning super bowl three it legitimized the afl so 
for many, many reasons, um, Joe, if you have to see him live, and plus he was beyond football. There was, you know, he was show business. He was everything. So there, there was just so much to Joe. He was as big as the Beatles. Um, <laughs> you know, everywhere we went, there were just, <laughs> there were just million, millions of people at, at the hotels everywhere. It was it was something that was uh, I was so fortunate to know, and he's such a great guy. But to try to find another Joe, that's why it was very hard on Richard Todd. Richard came in after Joe, and he had um, gone to Alabama, the same as Joe. He was a little a better runner, not as good a thrower, but he got us to the AFC Championship game by Walt Michaels using what his strengths were around the team. That's why Walt Michaels was a really good coach with the Jets. And which player are you most proud of like having scouted that the Jets ended up drafting? Well, it would be definitely Mark, Mark Gaston. That would be, <laughs> that would be definitely be the, the number one player, you know, because that's the one that I had the most input on. Other ones that I, you know, looked at, this, I, my basically thing would be to look at them, uh, to write up reports, and then put everything in the book, just like the other scouts. And then what I, my job in the day of the draft was, was uh, sitting on the phone. We would all be in the big room. And then when they announced who they were draft, who we would take, I would call in into New York and say, the New York Jets select. And in those days, it wasn't televised. Right. So again, until I, you know, it, it, it started getting televised the, the year after I, the year that I left the Jets, when we took Freeman McNeil, and the Giants took Lawrence Taylor on the pick before us. So, right. um, right from then on, you know, it, it's become such big time compared to that. But as I said before, that it was basically your um, your director of player personnel made a lot of the picks. Sometimes a general manager, but your director of player personnel had a lot of say. And then some teams, the coaches had a lot of say. So they were the ones, once you got the reports in, and then I basically was one calling it in. And just, I, I would have some certain favorite players that I hope we might take. But, you know, that's just, you just kind of wait and see if they're going to take any of those guys. Now, you're well known for having a encyclopedic knowledge of the Jets. Um, what's your most like obscure or fun fact about the, about the team? Wow, an, what, <laughs> an obscure or a fun fact about the team, <laughs> boy. <let's see. laughs> uh, you mean playing wise, or just as a team, or what? Absolutely anything. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. What can I think? Oh, the the growing up, the best part, the highlight was every Thanksgiving Day when we used to be at Shea Stadium, and I think when we went to to um, Giant Stadium for a while. Every Thanksgiving the guys would practice and then everybody would bring their families um, to the stadium and we would have our whole Thanksgiving dinner, you know, with the team after they practiced on Thanksgiving day. And all, I think everybody that experienced that, all, we all still talk about it to this day. That was one of the highlights. Of course, when, when Joe Namath was playing, that was the one time you really got to see Joe and talk with him because he could mingle because otherwise he was mobbed by everywhere he went. There was a thousand people around him. <laughs> so that, this was the one time he was just with a Jets family. And so that was like one of the uh, most fun things there that I say that the Jets did that I thought was a, a wonderful family. And back, back in the old days, um, it was very family. Now it's everything has grown so much. There's so many more people that work for the organization. You know, it, back then, you, as I said, we had a New York office that had the, the PR department and, and uh, the comptroller and a few things. And out on Long Island, we just had the players, and you just had the players, the coaches, and the training department, and the uh, scouting, and that's it. So and it was so it was really very 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 small. And everybody knew everybody, and it was very, very family-like. Oh, that's a really lovely story. Um, and my final <laughs> question, Connie, um, what advice would you give to a, a fellow female who, I guess, wants to follow your path and go into, like, the scouting route? Well, I tell you, well, right now there's so many opportunities. First of all, um, you see the, the, there is the opportunity. There's tackle football that and flag football. I didn't even have that opportunity to pl actually play the sport. So number one, women now have the chance to actually play the sport and put what they learn there into them becoming a scout. So that's a big advantage, number one, there. 
Now, of course, a lot of the colleges have sports management, and people, a lot of, a lot of young people are doing that, but it's, it's, there's a lot of competition. So you've got to really put yourself and make yourself a little bit different um, and seeking people out and doing different things versus just a piece of paper because there's so many people that want to get into it. But there are, uh, for the first time in the past couple of years, last two or three years now, you see a lot of the teams have women uh, scouting internships. And what, in fact, uh, in 2017... The Jets had three girls uh, as, as scouting interns, and one of them just got named to be the um, uh, Collie Bronson. She just got named uh, chief of staff for the Cleveland Browns. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of different opportunities now that I would say in the past, whew, I would say three years, the whole world has opened up. There was nothing like this, and now it's just there's um, – just Sam Rappaport with the NFL. She has all these different things at the, okay, at the combine and uh, different things um, at the draft where she has people come and speak. And she's had a lot of different people hired by different teams. So you just need to kind of, you know, look on Twitter, look on that, seek people out, let, you know, let people know what your, what, where your passion is. And, and uh, you know, you really got to, got to go after and just show that, that you love this thing so much. And also if you are scouting, be willing, either having an under, understanding spouse or significant other, <laughs> or be single, or be single, because you're going to be on the road on the road a lot and driving through little small towns. It's not glamorous. I mean, you, you might fly into it and go to Alabama, which is great, but then you're going to go to five other little small little schools around it and drive and everything. So you got to be really, and then you the next day up again and all, and you're on the road probably eight months of the year. Wow. So, so, you know, it's a it's a dedication type thing. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, amazing. Thanks, Connie. You're, you know, to me, you're an absolutely incredible inspiration, and it's been so lovely to speak with you today. Oh, well, thank you. So, I can't believe I'm speaking to somebody over, over, where, over where you are. I mean, it's yeah. amazing, really, to me. And it really <laughs> is. And, and I appreciate this so much and this opportunity and uh, – it's been it's been wonderful, and uh, I think we're all, we're all you know drawn together with our with our love of sports and our love of football. Absolutely, yeah. Got to keep that passion going.